The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hello, everybody. I hope that everyone can hear us. Uh, my name is Oliver White, and I'm the marketing dude and storyteller at TypeSafe, someone new to the company. And uh, it's my uh, great honor today to uh, introduce you to Jamie Allen, who you've probably heard of before. He's the author of Effective ACA, as well as Reactive Design Patterns. He's an awesome dude to have a beer with at a conference, and he gives great presentations. So I hope I've embarrassed him enough. And uh, let's, uh, let's hand it over to Jamie Allen. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's uh, exciting to be here. And thank you very much, Oliver, for the introduction that pretty much <laughs> took away all the slides I have introducing myself. That was awesome. <laughs> um, so this uh, webinar is going to be about going reactive in Java with the TypeSafe Reactive Platform. And just to frame this, uh, I recently got in a little bit of trouble at a conference where uh, somebody said to me, you know, I, I, don't, I don't hear TypeSafe talking about Scala quite so much. And I responded by saying that that's because TypeSafe is not the Scala company. TypeSafe is the reactive company. And in the Scala it really shouldn't. Because from our perspective, we believe that it doesn't matter the language you use to be reactive. While we do think that Scala is a language that is more supportive of a reactive uh, um, concepts, it doesn't mean that there aren't things you can do in Java that are equally reactive. Because let's face it, they're running on the same platform, and therefore they're both going to rely on the bytecode that is available to you in the JVM. So, uh, as Oliver pointed out, I'm the author of Effective ACA, and I'm also the co-author of the upcoming Reactive Design Patterns with Roland Kuhn, who is the head of the ACA team. And uh, I don't have a lot of time for book writing, but I certainly try to make sure that we don't release our chapters uh, with too much time in between them. So we're currently working on a chapter on fault tolerance, which is going to weigh heavily into this, this webinar that we're going to do today. So just to lay the groundwork, this is an era of profound change. And by that I mean it used to be that you know we could count on a certain number of users because of the limited number of devices out there. Uh, but now there are so many more kinds of devices that are hitting our various uh, endpoints for our business. And, you know, whether it's mobile or tablets or computers or B2B, it, it just doesn't matter. Right now we've got to be able to service all of the requests that are coming in as quickly as possible. And there are different kinds of applications that are hitting us as well. Uh, a couple of years ago, things were pretty static in the way that the applications were interacting with us. But now, these interactions are constant with all the information that's being streamed downward to our, our users. And then businesses are being pushed to be able to deal with this, uh, you know, in, in new ways. How are they going to be able to cope with all of the ways that they need to service their users and make sure that people stay customers and are happy? So as a necessity, businesses are going reactive. And let's look at some of the reasons why companies are going reactive. So, for example, Walmart saw, after the deployment of a Play application, uh, conversions go up 20%. Mobile orders go up 98%. That led to an increase of $1 billion in revenue for that year because they weren't going down whenever they had Cyber Monday. That's a significant increase in business and, and real value to the company. Uh, a lot of people know about Twitter. Um, Twitter used to be an application built on Ruby on Rails entirely. They achieved a greater than 10x performance improvement on the exact same hardware. And obviously we don't see the fail whale anymore either. Uh, Guild Group is an interesting company because 2005 or so they were launched and I remember back then there was a fellow named Gear Magnuson who was the CTO and anybody who knows the JEE world remembers Gear Magnuson as one of the leaders of the Apache Geronimo JEE server project. Um, back then you know, Gear would say that every day was white knuckles at 12 o'clock when 12 o'clock Eastern time in the U.S. they would release their flash sales. And all of a sudden, they had to be able to stay up and make sure that they, were, they weren't losing business because people were unable to buy the things that they wanted to. Uh, they were able to improve their elasticity such that they can literally scale their business two orders of magnitude within seconds. And that also means they're not wasting money by having servers up and running whenever they're not at that peak load point. 
So they're a really good example of a company that's able to deal with elasticity in a reactive way. And there are, if you search InfoQ for microservices and guilt, you will find a lot of presentations, including one that came out this week, I believe, about how they do microservices on AWS with Play Framework. Another example, and this one's pretty extreme, is Fidelity, where they they took an existing code base, it was 500,000 lines of code, and compressed it down to 5,000 lines of Scala. That's pretty extreme, and I wouldn't say representative of the norm, but it is pretty interesting nonetheless that a concise language that allows for expressiveness can help you write less code and therefore be easier to maintain. But going back to the Java use case explicitly, HP recently talked at uh, Scala Days San Francisco about how they reduced production server usage by 80% by using Akka with Java. And that is a significant savings to any company. As a matter of fact, they said they could have gone down to 90%, but they wanted to make sure they had some extra redundancy so that if anything went wrong, uh, you know, they, they, they wouldn't lose users. So that was really impressive statistics. And everybody wants to hear numbers. It can be difficult to get companies out there to talk about raw numbers for how they're, you know, how many requests per second they're dealing with or how many, um, how, how long the latency per request they have is. Uh, these are scary numbers to put out there. But we've gotten some companies who are so proud of the way they've been able to implement stuff that you know we're we're able to publish these numbers. We have companies out there that are handling in excess of 70, 80,000 requests per day. That's in excess of 700 billion. I'm sorry, 70, 80,000 requests per second. Don't listen to me about per day. Per day, that would be seven to eight billion requests per day. That's mind-boggling load for many companies, and yet they're able to withstand it by using reactive approaches. So, looking at that. Let's just look real quickly at the reactive application traits. For me, it all begins at the bottom where we talk about message driven. And with the earlier versions of the reactive manifesto, this was really about um, being event driven. But, you know, in talking with the community, and, and the great thing is the community has gotten greatly involved in how we, we describe what reactive means in the reactive manifesto, um, there was the belief that event driven conveyed locality that it meant that this was all running on one machine, where message-driven really implied that it could be handled by any machine, that a message could be consumed by any thread, by any machine, by any data center, if that kind of latency is acceptable in order to deal with the fact that another data center may have gone down. That all drives elasticity, being able to have your application scale up and down by need, as well as resilience, because if anything goes wrong in handling a message, you can always reconsume it, assuming you have an act. And then that all leads to a responsive experience for your users. So reactive applications, you know, they, they deal with the world around them and, and react as a result, as opposed to the idea that I can predict what the world is going to do and have the right resources and right capabilities in place in advance. With this whole message driven, we're encapsulating a couple of ideas beyond just the the ideas that this is all messages being handled out and people acknowledging that they've handled the message. There's also the concepts of asynchronous and non-blocking. And by that, I'm going to give you a quick analogy that I've been using recently. Um, this may sound a little odd to some people, but I actually like to wash dishes. And not only that, but I'm one of those people that and not only do I like to wash dishes, but then when I'm done washing the dishes, I actually put them into the dishwasher so that they can be washed again, which is a little distressing for people here in San Francisco, I guess, because I might be one of those people using a little too much water. But that said, my dishes are nice and clean, so that makes me happy. Anyway, <clears throat> the reason I'm bringing this up is I want to explain the differences between asynchronous and non-blocking, but I also want to talk about concurrency versus parallel. And if I'm a person who's washing dishes and I have a stack of dishes on my left-hand side and I'm going to rinse them and I'm going to scrub them and I'm going to rinse them again and I'm going to put them into the dishwasher, there's no way for me to go any faster about that. It's a purely synchronous serial process and there's, that's just the way it's going to be. But if I invite somebody over to my house and I say, hey, why don't you come wash dishes with me? And they come over and, and, they, and I say to them, okay, please start washing dishes. I have now spawned asynchronous work. Somebody else, another thread of execution is going off and doing that work for me. 
And if I happen to sit right behind them with my arms crossed and not moving, then I'm blocking. I'm not doing anything else. I'm just sitting there waiting until they're finished washing my dishes. And this is really how threads with futures worked pre-Java 8 with the existing Java futures API. Uh, now in Java 8, we have completable future, and that's purely asynchronous and non-blocking, and that's really exciting. But the old Java futures, unfortunately, were not. So how do I spawn work that is asynchronous and non-blocking? If I were able to spawn the work and say, hey, somebody, please wash my dishes for me, I'm going to go have some coffee or play with my kids or something like that, then I'm non-blocking, but I'm also not making any difference in how fast this work is being done. So that's not helpful. It might be helpful in that I could do other things that are useful, but still, it would be better if I could find ways to make the process of having the work of dishes being done go faster. And that's always going to be dependent on where I'm having points of contention in the process with other people. So for example, if I say to the person who's come over and wash my dishes that, hey, I, you know, I'll, I'll wash dishes with you. You are going to grab the dish and you're going to rinse it off and scrub it and then I'm going to rinse it off and I'll put it into my dishwasher. Now, I am non-blocking, I am asynchronous, but I'm concurrent. I'm now depending on the other person to hand me dishes and if they have something that's particularly dirty, it could take a while for it to reach me and I could be sitting there waiting doing nothing else. That's not particularly good either. More importantly, we have shared mutable state beyond the dish. We have the faucet that we're sharing, the sink, and we've got to contend for the right to who gets to use the faucet as we're going through this process. So what we really want to be is asynchronous, non-blocking, and as parallel as possible where we don't have touch points. And that's a really big deal. So the only way we can do that is for me to say, you know what, I've got another sink in my house because maybe I've got a really big house. I don't actually, but it'd be great if I did. And I grab a stack of dishes and I go to another place and I go and wash the dishes completely independent of the other person. Now we have a speed up without contention. We're not waiting for each other to do work. Now, you may think about this in terms of a fork join pool with Java. Fork join is going to say, well, I've got you know, uh, the ability to spread work across all the cores available inside of my JVM. But there's two points where I'm going to have contention. And one is where I'm breaking apart the work to each of the cores that is going to do it. And I'm doing that recursively. I'm breaking down this work, right? Which, if you think about it in most simplistic sense, would be me grabbing half of the stack of dishes to go off and do work where somebody else had the other half. It may have been a case where I was grabbing every other dish to do it and putting it into another pile. That wouldn't make a lot of sense because I don't have to do that. But if I did have to do that for some reason, some, some coordination point or ordering reason, then I would have problems as far as trying to split the work apart. And then there's the join task at the end. I, I run all that work in parallel where we wash the dishes, but I've got to join it at the end somehow. And that also is a point of contention. And that would be the place where we're putting the dishes into the dishwasher. If we're both trying to do that at the same time, then we're contending for slots in the dishwasher. So that can be really tricky. Think about that when you're using fork join pool. For example, if you're using parallel collections in Java, these are a new exciting construct in Java 8, but they may have more cost than if you just had a serial task that was working through an extremely cache-friendly data collection like an array. So you have to take this into account when you're thinking in terms of how you're going to deal with work and be as performant as possible. But your goal should be asynchronous and non-blocking and fully parallel with as minimal points of contention inside of them. And just another example of concurrent versus parallel. This is from Joe Armstrong, the creator of Erlang. He came up with it, I don't know, two years ago. And it looks like the sort of thing he might have driven, written on the back of a napkin or something like that. But he was just making the point that concurrency is where you have two queues vying for the right to go to one copy machine. And if it's a purely fair queuing system, then one line goes, then the other line goes, then one line goes, then the other line goes. But there are no guarantees of that. You might want to speed that up somehow by doing some batching and therefore uh, being a little friendlier to the uh, work being done as far as you, you batch things together, you might be able to get more performance. Uh, do five from one line, then do five from the other. Uh, but, you know, that depends on the algorithm and the kind of work being done. 
Really, if you want ultimate performance, you want the bottom example where you're being purely parallel using two queues and two individual copy machines. That comes at a footprint cost though, right? Because the extra footprint is the other copy machine that you're using. And footprint does imply extra you know, monetary cost, whether it's cores of execution or machines, but it does mean that you have the ability to run in parallel and more in isolation from one another. So that's a big deal. Uh, and in getting back to my point about splitting work apart and the cost of the things where you have dependencies, we have Amdahl's law, which is stating that you can never be faster than the, the slowest point of your execution pipeline. Right? If there's one part of it that's going to cost you 50% of your work while other things are being done, you can't be faster than that 50%. That's it. And as you're trying to split this work across more and more cores, you may actually hit a limit to how fast you can go, how much you can scale, where you're adding additional cores and adding additional work simply isn't making you any quicker. So think about that and also measure that. Use tools at your disposal like Java Micro Benchmarking Harness, which is created by Alexei Shipilov at Oracle, uh, to find out how much performance benefit you're getting as you're splitting work apart. But reactive applications also scale up and down to meet demand. And by that, you know, we're, we're embracing the cloud, but it can actually be a virtualization of our own platforms, our own hardware inside of our own data centers. We want to leverage all the cores inside of our boxes and not waste these. For example, uh, look at the way we, we buy boxes today. Uh, commodity hardware typically is going to say that, you know, uh, when you're checking off your order of boxes, uh, I mean, what kind of RAM are you going to get with these boxes? It could be, you know, 92 gig minimum. And you say, all right, well, I'm probably only going to run a JVM on this that leverages, I don't know, uh, four gigabytes of it, right? Because there is an effective limit with the JVM as far as garbage collection goes with compaction and collection stop the world phases. So how are we going to leverage that machine to be the most effective usage of that platform? There are machines today that each have 18 cores on a single socket, and that could be a dual socket machine, so you have 36 cores of execution. That's a lot to use, and you know what? You may actually want to run two JVMs on them where you're pinning the work to the individual socket. And in doing so, you're going to share a single L3 cache for the entire application running on that JVM instance. And therefore, you don't have cross-socket communication because threads aren't coordinating beyond the barriers of that individual processor. So, you know, that, that kind of thinking can scale up beyond just the individual machine to racks, to, to the data centers, to, to the availability zones in the cloud. Think about how you're going to get maximum usage of the machines at your disposal so that you're not wasting any of these resources. And also giving yourself the ability to deal with, you know what, I'm not using these resources. How do I elastically scale back down? And then reactive applications are architected to deal with failure at every level. And when I say every level, I mean, you know, exceptions happening on a thread or whenever you have a... Uh, a JVM go down because of an out of memory error or because a node, you know, a single machine goes down uh, or, um, you know, a virtual machine, if you will, running, you know, co-located on a machine with other people. How are you going to deal with all kinds of failures, network partitions, data centers going down, availability zones going down? This had a really big impact on Netflix a couple years ago where I think at Christmas time and, you know, the holiday season in 2011, they they had a major outage on the AWS and it really affected their business. Nobody could watch streaming video. And as a result of that, one of the things Netflix started to do was say, all right, well, how do we test whether or not we're resilient to failure? And they came up with the concept of the Simeon Army. If you check out uh, the Chaos Monkey, for example, you'll see that this is something they literally let loose in production to take down JVMs, to take down nodes and see how that affects their user experience. People joke about how, you know, whenever I test, I test in production. Well, in a certain respect, maybe you should. Maybe you should be checking whether or not outages will have an effect on your actual users. And that, you know, will drive your business to being more resilient to any kind of failures that occur. With Netflix, they went beyond just the idea of the chaos monkey taking down nodes. They came up with the chaos uh, gorilla, I think it's called, where they take down 
uh, an availability zone. Mind you, they're not taking it down for everybody on an AWS availability zone. It's only virtual to their users. But still, that's a really big deal. Then they have something called the Chaos Kong, which I think takes down an entire Amazon region for themselves. And they're checking to make sure that the user experience is uninterrupted. So if you're watching Netflix, just think of all the things that are running around in their, in their platform, in their deployment area, you know, testing constantly whether or not they're able to withstand failure. It's a really great way to think about how you as a business are going to be able to deal with this as well. But also think in terms of how applications will self-heal. If you miss a message, something coming through your system does not get from one place to another, what effect will that have on your, on your business? If I'm a large cable company and somebody calls up and says, I want to cancel my subscription for a premium channel and I don't get that message in the place where I'm calculating who has the right to watch what, well, they could keep watching that channel in perpetuity, you know, until at some point in time somebody says, you know what, we're out of sync with that data store over there. We need to completely reload. And that's assuming I even noticed it. That is not the way you want to think about building systems. Instead, you want to think about how you're constantly going to resolve and be eventually consistent with some source of truth out there. If you know that there's some database out there that represents everything that you need to be able to show in some other cache or some other view, then you should constantly be resolving that instead of saying, oh, well, I get a message and therefore I, put, I update this information over here. Because if any of those get lost, and they will and do, then you would, you would probably be hurting your business. So isolate failure at every level of your application. Think about it in terms of threads, within a node, across many nodes, across many physical servers, across data centers. Think about it at every level of your deployment, what you will do so that you have a plan. And then you can actually put into place structure that uh, gives you the capability of dealing with that kind of failure. And then finally, reactive applications enrich the user experience with low latency response. So we do not want our users to be waiting a very long time. One of the reasons Walmart was so successful with their deployment of Play was because they went from a, having a latency per request where it was taking seven or eight seconds per page load down to just two or three. Now, two or three still doesn't sound like you know, a world-beating experience, but if you were somebody using the site before, that's a significant improvement. And it, mind you, that's also because they had dependencies on legacy systems that they weren't replacing all at once. So there were still points where they couldn't make this you know, particular interaction faster. But they made it significant enough that they had higher engagement, which led to more people buying stuff on their site. Now, we say here fully reactive enabling push instead of pull. Well, if you're in a real kind of back pressure situation where you need to be able to communicate the fact that a system is being overwhelmed, that's not entirely true. With the new reactive streams approach that we're using inside of, uh, you know, Akka now with Akka Streams, and this is a collaboration involving Pivotal with their Rat Pack and Reactor uh, tools. We're including Netflix with their Arcs Java. Twitter is involved because they're they are a company that replaced their Storm system with a new implementation that they got four times the performance uh, with. Uh, we're also including Vertex. Uh, so these are companies that might traditionally be considered competitors of Type Safe, but we're all working on ways to find out the best way to deal with streaming data because streaming data is the future. And it always blows my mind to think about The Matrix way back in the day, you know, 1998, and even the movie that inspired The Matrix before that, where they thought about the world and how we would view it in terms of streaming data, those characters flowing down the screen. That blew my mind. Because in 1998, as somebody who was programming back then, I can tell you, nobody was talking about streaming data, that's for sure. So somehow, people who were uh, trying to envision how the world would be imagined and, and, and codified into uh, data, they came up with the idea that it had to be streams. That's pretty mind-blowing. So with reactive streams, we're saying that it really should be a back and forth between push and pull, where you're constantly saying, as the consumer, I can handle this much data. I can handle this much data. By the way, I can't handle any more data right now. And on the producer side, it's responding by putting that much data into, you know, the the point of consumption, right? 
and whether that's some queue or whether that's some sort of message broker or who knows what. But this constant back and forth in communication gives the ability to have a sliding scale between when you're in a push model and when you're in a pull model. And uh, and I think that's uh, it's 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 interesting to me because I'm no longer using a circuit breaker way of saying that I need to enforce back pressure. Where I said that you know I'm I'm getting overwhelmed over here, so I'm going to open the circuit, and that means that whoever's trying to send me data is going to fail fast with an exception, saying, oh you know what I can't send anything. I need to wait a little bit. So the sliding scale gives you a little more you know concreteness. You can actually see when you're when you're starting to become overloaded as opposed to just being told all of a sudden that you can't send any more data. And the other interesting thing about reactive streams is that Pivotal, VertX, you know, RxJava, TypeSafe, we're all working together to break down the walls of stream handling so that you're no longer saying that when you receive something in VertX, you can't handle that as Pivotal Spring Reactor data, right? You just say as Reactor, or you say as Akka, or as RxJava, and any one of these can allow for interoperability, which is super exciting because we no longer have this tribal approach to this is the only way you build software and you're stuck with this stack and can't use anything else because it's unrealistic. In the enterprise, we have tons of different systems that are going to be working in different technologies. We can't replace all of them all at once. We can provide interfaces where they can interoperate cleanly. So the cost of writing applications that are not reactive are significant. It's a cost to your wallet as an organization and the environment because you're also leveraging unnecessary hardware. That's you know going to affect the energy usage in a particular region, and that's not very green. Plus, I mean, let's face it, for a business, the real problem is that you're not being responsive to your users in the face of bursty traffic or whenever things go wrong, and that can lead to a loss of customers. So with a type safe reactive platform, you know. People always hear people at TypeSafe talking about Scala, but we are big believers in Java, and that's the reason why we always provide a first-class experience for Java through our tooling. And when you look at Play and you look at Akka, from the very beginning, they've always had pure experiences for people using the Java APIs. In fact, Akka is, is more pure than Play's because Akka doesn't rely on you having to deal with any constructs that are specific to you know, Scala. Whereas with Play, there is a slightly different experience for people who are on the Java API versus the Scala API. And to know how serious we are about this, all you have to do is look at the other uh, you know, uh, RESTful API framework that we have. It's called Spray. We're now moving that into what we call Akka HTTP. And the primary reason is that we had to make it completely 100% usable from the Java API as well, because that's what we believe is important. Um, so Java is just as important to us as Scala. And for what it's worth, more people are using Play and Akka from Java than they are from Scala, even today. So it's roughly 52% for Akka and 53, 55, somewhere in there for Play. And then underneath this, you'll see that there's a new tool called TypeSafe Conductor, which is a way of deploying Akka and Play applications. And in Spark, you may notice here, uh, because we're going to have our own distribution. It just uh, was released today that supports Java and Scala 2.11 that uh, can be deployed across your hardware using a tool called TypeSafe Conductor. So let's talk about Java. As I mentioned, there's more than 50% of TypeSafe's customers, you know, for Akka and Play that are using them from the Java ABI, APIs. And the reasons are, you know, I think many. First of all, few languages have as much enterprise support and stability, but let's think about this as well. I've already talked about asynchronous and non-blocking, concurrent and parallel. In, in the time that we've been writing code, at least for the you know, 20 years I've been doing it, um, we've never had to think about these very much. But the advent of multi-core really forced us to. If we're going to leverage all the cores of execution that are available to us, how are we going to express who is able to change what data and when? And that's a lot for developers to have to think about. And I totally understand whenever a company says to me, I really do love your platform with Play and Akka, but I'm not ready to tell my team that they have to understand all of those concepts and learn a new language. And that absolutely makes sense to me. Uh, many of our largest customers for our technologies uh, use it from the Java API, and that includes GE, 
who was building their entire Internet of Things back end using you know Play Framework with Java. So every refrigerator, every uh, you know coffee maker or microwave is talking back to Play through Java. Rogers Communications in Canada is a, one of our largest customers. They're also using Akka and Play from the Java API. I mentioned HP and the reduction in the number of servers they were using to handle the same load. Uh, they are using the Java API for Akka. And we have other companies as well, like, you know, there are groups in Apple that are using Akka with uh, Java. Um, there are other groups in Apple who are also using Scala. So they're pretty independent there. Sometimes, you know, one group and another group, they, they don't choose technologies or their approaches based upon what's happening with other groups per se. So, you know, some groups stay with Java and some groups go to Scala. It's entirely up to them. Um, and Java 8 has brought many of the syntax features that are included for more expressive APIs, which leads to another interesting point. We've actually recently seen a large customer of ours, LinkedIn, talk about how despite the fact that they have a large amount of Scala, they feel that Java 8 will give them many of the features that they want, and they're actually going to go back to Java 8 as a primary language and not build so much with Scala anymore. And that's interesting to us. And, and it's not a problem because it would be an issue if somebody said, well, I can only use Play Framework if I use it with Scala. We think it's a real sign of flexibility and the ability for people to get work done by the fact that they're able to use Java or Scala and not have to make a choice. So let's look at Akka and, and how we use this with Java. First of all, for people who aren't familiar with Akka, I just want to give a really quick example of what this is. And it's a little esoteric. It's not something that people you know, can automatically get their head around because it's not like a web framework. People understand what a web framework is, but Akka is this toolkit that gives you a whole bunch of different things you can use to deal with concurrency. So think about how you might build classes and how they would talk to each other by you know, calling methods on, on one another. Well, instead, what if you didn't call methods and instead you just you know, passed a message? Well, that also implies that whenever the class that is going to consume that message is doing so, it is not doing anything else. And therefore, there is no concurrency inside of that actor. Now, this whole actor model raises the abstraction level because you don't have that shared state because only one thread is operating inside of that actor. But then there's a the concept of memory visibility. So, you know, if, if, for, for experienced Java developers, we know that we have a Java memory model, which was a really big deal whenever it came out. Because before that, we had no guarantees of what thread could see what or who was doing what at any point in time. And that implies two things. There's the concept of happens before, where if I have a thread A which is doing something, and I have a thread B which is doing something else, if thread A is doing something before thread B, it should be visible to thread B when thread, thread B is going to do another thing. So that's the concept of happens before. But then we also have the concept of synchronize with, which is this idea that if I'm going to do something and I'm exclusively blocking the right to do so, whenever I'm done, that should be pushed all the way back to main memory which is an extreme cost actually because data going from a core of execution all the way back to main memory is roughly a cost of about 180 to 200 nanoseconds roughly 65 clock cycles so uh, wait a minute I might have that backwards it's uh, 65 nanoseconds which is roughly 180 to 200 clock cycles apologies for that so yeah, that's, that's pretty pretty significant cost to have to publish that data all the way back. And worse yet, with locking, I have to think in terms of who's going to arbitrate a contended lock. A contended lock is going to be arbitrated at the kernel level, which means that my application is running and it reaches a point on one thread where it's going to contend for a lock with another thread. And at that point, knowing it's contended, they both come off that core of execution, and the kernel says, all right, thread A, you get to go. Then thread B, you're next. But now they've got to run again. And at that point, they've got to be scheduled on another core, and all the warm caches they had before then are pretty much gone. So they, all that data has to be reloaded from wherever it last was. That's painful. So we want the idea of using volatile more than the idea of using locking so that we can have higher performance, but then we have to think about threads and whether or not they can see the changes that we're making. So that's a big deal. But if you use a tool like Akka, Akka is going to make sure that guarantee is there for you. And there's a reason for that. 
ACA, you know, you could have 10 messages in a mailbox for an actor, and they're going to be handled one by one by one. But you may have set the fairness for the thread on ACA to be the default value of handle five messages before giving that thread to somebody else and giving them a chance to do work. And if you do that, then out of those 10 messages, the first five will be handled on one thread, but there's no guarantee that the next five will be handled on the same thread. It could be on a completely different one. And if that is the case, how is the second thread going to see the changes made by the first one when it handled those first five messages? That's a big deal and hard to get right. But if you use an abstraction like ACA, you never have to think about it. It's provided for you because ACA guarantees happens before. So you get to spread work across all the cores, but you don't have to think about who gets to see what and how. It makes it very easy for you to write concurrent programs. And you also get high CPU utilization, lower latency, higher throughput by leveraging more of your footprint. That's a, you know, just a fantastic thing as far as I'm concerned. This is why people are able to do more work on less machines. So applications are also more reliable because we have a hierarchical topology through which we define our application. And in doing so, we can always say that there's a parent who is supervising what work I'm doing. So supervising is the key concept to how we're going to deal with threads or machines or JVMs or, or any part of our world not being available to us anymore and, and why. So before, whenever we're writing applications, especially in the Java world, you would see people using thread pools, right? And this is a great way using some sort of fixed thread pool or maybe a, a fork join pool uh, to define that you're going to spread work around on multiple cores and they're all just going to be executed and run and that's great. But what happens if I say, all right, thread, go off and do this work with a callable or runnable. And whenever uh, there's an exception in that thread that I spawned, do I see it? Am I notified? No. All that happens if you don't define any behavior is that you see a, a uh, you know, a stack trace in your console. And the console is ephemeral. It can disappear at any point in time because it's just, you know, a flowing list of all the things that are being written out to the console from the JVM. So most people will say, all right, well, inside of my thread pool, I have one thing I can define, the uncaught exception handler. And with the uncaught exception handler, I'm going to, you know, go off and uh, say what to do when anything goes wrong on this thread pool. But I've yet to meet anybody who was, who was thinking about thread pools as a domain concept and saying, well, then only these particular um, units of work should be executed on the, these thread pools. And in doing so, that would give them the capability to say, well, okay, what exception came back? and my uncaught exception handler and how do I deal with it, right? That would be, you know, at least some sort of level of isolation, but very few people do that. Nobody thinks of thread pools as a domain concept. And as a result, all they ever put inside of their uncaught exception handler is log. You know, log.error or log.warning or something like that. And therefore, at least their logs capture now the fact that there was something that went wrong on that thread. It's better than nothing but it's still not a great way to deal with failure inside of your application. So supervision is a really big deal. And think about supervision not just as me being the one who spawned the work on, a, on the same thread pool or on a different thread pool. What if it was on a different machine? How do I see what happens on a completely different machine? With ACA, we're building a system, a tree of actors, and we don't know or care where they're deployed. The concept of a guardian is just sort of sitting out there as the end-all, be-all for anything that, that happens to percolate all the way up our tree. But if we see something happening at a lower place down on our, our, uh, you know, our actor supervisor hierarchy, we can have a parent who's responsible for saying what we do about that. And you'll notice here that the actors are sort of set up in a file system-like uh, structure because file systems are trees as well. So that's an interesting thing, and it doesn't matter whether this is on the same machine or a completely different machine. I can watch foo uh, slash a from bar, and bar could be in a different data center. And I would get a message, albeit somewhat latent, that, you know, something went wrong over here. And I might want my a 
to also respond and, and, and know what to do as a result of that. So how do we do that from the Java API? And if you look at this code, I know it looks a little bit complex here, but just look at the top part where we're defining the supervisor strategy. And here I'm saying that for any one issue that goes wrong, I'm going to provide one thing to do for that one actor. I'm not going to say every actor under me is going to respond for this. And I'm going to say if it happens 10 times within one minute, I'm going to say if I get an arithmetic exception, don't worry about it, just keep going. If I get a null pointer exception, I've got some state inside of my actor which isn't quite right, so let's restart that actor. And that means that the message in this mailbox is still there, but any internal state inside of my actor gets rebuilt. And if I see anything else, I'm going to escalate that because that could be a problem. Let's think in a more domain-specific way. What if I got a class cast exception trying to handle some JSON that came on, on a message? And I look at that and say, all right, well, you know, that wasn't that big of a deal. Uh, so I'm going to resume. I don't care that I got this class cast exception. Maybe I did put the the you know, bad JSON off to the side somewhere and tell it to, you know, somebody else will handle that later. But, you know, just keep going. Keep consuming more JSON. Uh, but I might also get some sort of database connection error. And that would be a problem because I can no longer connect to the database where I take my transform JSON and put it somewhere. So if I have that, I might say, you know what, I need to escalate this and have somebody who provided me with my database connection to provide me with a new one or, you know, get rid of me and create a new instance with a new connection once a new connection has been established. That's the way we can start building a whole concept of a domain of what we do when failure occurs inside of our applications because those failures are now nothing more than messages. And that's a really critical concept. Failure is a message just like anything else. Um, so we can, we, can, we can define failure and how we deal with it inside of these actor supervisor hierarchies. And we can create a child that's underneath me. That child may or may not be on the same thread pool. It doesn't matter. I can still watch it and deal with failures that occur inside of it. Really, really wonderful way of handling failure inside of your application. And I don't even need to be the parent actor of this. Remember how I said in the example where we were looking at bar and bar could watch the foo A over here? Well, bar is watching that using something called watch. So it says, I'm going to watch some actor. In this case, we call it a child, but don't, it doesn't matter. It could be any actor, right? And if I receive a message that that foo A has been terminated, well, I could say, here's what I want to do as a result of that. It doesn't matter where it's located. I will find out because Akka will provide me with that information. So this is a completely different way of thinking about failure than we've ever been doing before. And for a lot of Java developers, we know about domain-driven design from Eric Evans. And there's a, a newer author these days named Vaughn Vernon who uh, does a lot of work with Akka in building domain-driven design type systems. Uh, if you look up vaughnvernon.com, you'll find that he's written the Akka, uh, the, well, you know, the enterprise integration patterns in Akka, every single one of them. Uh, and they're publicly there for you to view in GitHub. Um, but you have to think in terms of domain events from DDD. And we're really good about modeling domain events that represent the success case, but we are not really good about thinking in terms of all the things that can go wrong. Instead, we tend to wrap things in try catch blocks and stuff like that. But that's a very tactical way and, and very difficult to compose way of dealing with various failures inside of our system. Instead, think of them as messages. And who is responsible for handling that particular message of failure? Or worse yet, if something happens that you didn't think about in advance, what will your default strategy be for that? Supervision gives you those kind of capabilities. Nothing else does. So. Other features of Akka are things like full cluster support, which allow for sharding, where you have multiple instances of actors across uh, a bunch of nodes, and we route, you know, our, our messages to them on some, you know, strategy, whether it's round robin or by consistent hash or something like that. We have conflict-free replicated data structures, which is an interesting new way of thinking in terms of um, state that is replicated across many nodes. And one of the companies that's best known, I think, for CRDTs are Basho with Reoc. Uh, they're really at the forefront of this technology. Uh, we're doing it for Akka replication. 
and uh, you'll see it in ACA 2.4 as a production ready you know, uh, component inside of ACA. We have persistent actors using event sourcing. We have integration with Apache Camel, so you can have all those different endpoints that everybody's so used to from the Java world. We're fully OSGI compatible and have been for years. I know this because I worked with uh, you know these tools in an OSGI environment years ago. Uh, and we have a test kit, which is support for asynchronous and di distributed testing that is very difficult to do without a framework helping you do so. Especially if you think in terms of how am I going to test that if I send 100 messages into an actor, how am I going to make sure that every one of those requests is responded to with the right answer? Because you should be thinking about testing like that. You should be thinking in terms of not just do I send a message, do I get the right response? You should be sending a thousand messages and making sure every single one of them gets the right response to make sure that there are no race conditions or issues in the way that you're saying who gets to get what response inside of that actor. And then coming soon, there was that concept of ACA streams, which I mentioned before, the reactive push-pull model for back pressure and handling streaming data. Um, that's available in a milestone release right now, and RC should be out very soon. And ACA 2.4 will be released with it. And ACA HTTP, which is the replacement for Spray, which has the Java API as well, and WebSocket support, which is super exciting. Now let's look at the Play framework. And, you know, most people understand what a web framework is, but Play is a little different in that for the first time, somebody actually sat down and said, building an application, a web application on the JVM should not be a non-fun experience. And yet for most of us, it always has been. The tooling that we've had has made it difficult. Let's think, uh, I've got to compile my application, then I've got to put it in a jar, and I've got to put that jar over here inside of some deployment context for a container, and then I've got to start the container, and then I can find out whether the little change I just made actually works. With Play, you literally sit there and you code something, you go to your browser, you refresh with F5 or you know Command R or whatever you know command you use, and boom, it recompiles and deploys and runs for you without any of that muss or fuss, which is such a big improvement for developer happiness. And that's why people don't enjoy building web applications on Java and why Ruby on Rails got so much traction. People could do things quickly. But it's also nice to have static typing and performance. So we think Play is a really big improvement over Ruby on Rails. Um, and you get that rapid development and iteration, but the real key is the containerless, asynchronous, and non-blocking experience. And by containerless, I mean, you know, you're not running this inside of a JEE container like WebLogic. You're not running it inside of Tomcat or Jetty. It will start up its own server and manage the threading model itself. Because whereas, um, whereas before we had the idea of, um, you know, um, Whereas before we had the idea of asynchronous with the servlet specification version 3.0, it didn't say anything about blocking. And it also didn't say it changed anything about the one thread per request model. Whereas Play doesn't worry about that at all. It's just spawning work and allowing all of its threads to be maximum, be utilized to their maximum. So Play is based on HTTP and it has an asset compiler so you can have things like CopyScript or less or other tools that uh, can be compiled down into uh, you know, a grouping of, of front-end technologies. Uh, JSON is a first-class citizen. We have WebSocket support here. And you know, it can be used for the entire JVM library. You don't have to use templating in play. You don't have to use an ORM in play. You can use JPA or Angular or whatever it is you want to do. And this is sort of the way that Play is, is, is getting maximum scalability. Like Ruby on Rails, it's always pushing you toward being stateless in your web tier and not caching information about a session inside of the server so that every request between the client and, that, and, and the back end has to go to that specific server. Instead, it's just a stateless interaction and therefore, you know, the... That means that you have linear scalability and allowing you to start up more and more servers to handle increased load. So a really simple example of what Play looks like from Java here. Here's a controller. Whenever you get you know, a call to your index.html, you have a route set up that says go to this controller method index, and it returns with an OK, which is at 200 with the you know, payload of hello, everybody. 
Pretty simple, right? But let's look at something more interesting. What about the ability to use web services that are purely asynchronous and use things like OAuth and OpenID? And in this case, you're saying, well, I want to go off and I, I want to hit page.com, whatever that might actually be, right? I'm creating a web service request, and then once I have that, I can get an asynchronous response by saying request.get. And as a result of that, uh, I can then perform actions based upon you know, what I get back from there. I could also do a post in a much similar fashion where I re reference the request and I set the content type and then I do a post. Very simple. But the way I handle the data that comes back is a really big deal. Now I mentioned before that futures in Java 6 and 7 were not non-blocking. Right? They were blocking futures. If I spawned work, I had to wait as the one who spawned that work until all of those other threads I spawned to do work were completed. So there was always an extra thread sitting around not progressing or doing anything, which is a cost and footprint and wasteful. So even pre-Java 8 with Play, you have the completely asynchronous and non-blocking API through the Play Promise API. And here's an example where I compute pi in some asynchronous way, and I return a promise, you know, of some new function that's going to return a double with some behavior in here that actually calculates pi, and that's what you see inside of the return dot, dot, dot. Um, at the same time, I have my ability to get that information where I say, well, I have the promise of a result by calling compute pi async, and then I map over the result that comes back, and I provide behavior of what to do with the value that is returned. And we have my result that is the apply of the value I get back and I can say okay 200 pi value computed to be the specific value. And it's all completely asynchronous and non-blocking even though it's not Java 8 completable future. That's a really big deal. And then on top of that we do have Java 8 support which does make the, the code so much cleaner. You, you do have lambdas and for what it's worth I am known as the person out there who says that lambdas are no fun and that you shouldn't use them. But let's face it a lot of people are going to and, and that means your code is going to be less testable and less maintainable and you're going to get stack traces that are tougher and they're not as composable but hey you know what that's fine. Uh, just just know that the, the code does get more expressive when you go in this more functional style, even with Java 8. So, very simple. So, Reactive is being adopted across a wide range of industries. And you look at the kinds of companies that TypeSafe is working with, and this doesn't even include all of them. Just just look at, uh, these are the ones we're allowed to talk about more than anything else. And I can, I can mention Apple, but I can't put Apple on a slide like this, right? Um, Goldman Sachs is, you know, their CEO is talking about how he's standardizing on the TypeSafe reactive platform across their organization. Morgan Stanley has been extremely involved in the, you know, the reactive platform environment for a very long time, including contributing major libraries that have become part of the TypeSafe ecosystem. Uh, the Internet of Things has been an area that we, I, I'm not sure we really ex expected quite so much, and yet it's become huge for us. Where we have companies like John Deere and GE and Nest and you know Renault and all sorts of uh, companies like uh, uh, Nokia with their um, inter in in car entertainment system as well. Um, in the technology world, we've got HP and Juniper and Amazon and I mean we're known in the social world just because of Twitter's success using our platform and LinkedIn as well, Tumblr. But at the same time. Uh, a lot of companies will look at that and say, you know, well, you know, we're not one of those technology companies. We're not like them. We're much, we're much more like the enterprise and, and traditional. And this shows that the enterprise is also all over these technologies, and they're using them to their fullest to get maximum productivity out of their machines and developers. So, TypeSafe delivers the world's leading reactive platform on the JVM. To get started, go to TypeSafe.com and download Activator and you will find plenty of individual templates out there, much like Maven archetypes that show you how to get started using various technologies like Akka, like Play, and you can search for them using Java and Java 8. There are tags there that will show you exactly what you might be looking for. So that's it. Let's take some questions here, Oliver. All right. <clears throat> well, I, I was clapping uh, already, so... Uh, if everyone can uh, share their applause uh, in the uh, questions chat. 
I do have a, we don't have terribly much time, but in the time that we do have, there's a handful of questions about ACA and a couple questions about play as well. Where, where would you like to start, Jamie? Uh, well, let's take uh, like uh, one of each at a time. We'll, we'll just be fair about it. Okay. Uh, ACA. Uh, how does ACA's concept work with database transactions? Can several actors share one transaction, or should each actor use its own transaction? I would recommend something that we call the saga pattern here. And in my effective ACA book, I, I tried to break it down into a simpler concept with uh, what I call the cameo and the the um, the uh, extra pattern. You know, just to follow these names that are like actors in movies. Um, in this particular case, what you want to do is represent a single transaction as an actor. And if you if you're only doing a read, right, where you're going to read from multiple places in, a, in an optimistic fashion, um, then you can have a lot of different ways to handle that that read side, right? You say that, well, I'm a I'm going to show bank account information for a customer. I'm going to show checking account, savings account, and money market account information. So I'm going to hit three different services to get that data. And if two of them come back, like checking and money market comes back, but savings doesn't, I may still want to respond with that information to the user as quickly as possible while showing them a widget that says, hey, I'm still working on your savings data, right? And then you can provide that data when it's completed or time out because you don't want to bang your head against the door. The number one thing to think about when any time you're using asynchronous interactions is that you should bound it in both time and space. You should do it five times within one second and then say, you know what, I'm not going to be able to do this. You know, so that you have a way of saying, I don't want to hammer my system constantly forever, right? Um, and if, if, if you're talking about rights, then you have a much more domain-specific way to be able to handle this. But you do have to think about the consistency of your world. So the saga pattern specifically, you know, prescribes the idea that I need to be able to represent the transactions that are taking place and the rollbacks that take place so that I'm always in a consistent state across my three databases. If I'm updating information in my checking, savings, and money market account, and two out of three of those fail, then what do I do with the one that succeeded? Do I roll that back? I don't know. It depends upon your domain. But the great thing is, unlike the old app transactional annotation, you can express that through logic that's specific to the domain concept you're dealing with right there, the specific domain interaction, as opposed to where at transactional was just this big blunt hammer that would, you know, just roll everything back and didn't give you any semantics for how to deal things and deal with things in unique ways. So I recommend that you create an actor representing a context that is that transactional uh, interaction and define the behavior very specifically about how you're going to deal with changes to data and making sure that you're consistent across the multiple stores you're dealing with. Um, do you want to do All a right. play question now? Yeah, that, was, that previous question was by uh, Valery Lobachyov. Okay. Uh, the next question, actually, there's two play questions uh, that are kind of, the first one is, is, uh, is play framework, uh, are play framework controller methods asynchronous by default? Um, our play framework control. Yeah, they can be multi-threaded. It depends on underneath the hood of play. It's using Akka, right? And it's using it's using these concepts that you know are a little foreign from the Java world called iterates, and specific for things like streaming data. Yes, they they are asynchronous by default. Okay. Uh, piggybacked onto that is. Some people say that they're concerned about using Play because it's not as fast as other frameworks. Has its performance been measured and compared with what other frameworks could achieve? And actually, we just released on SlideShare uh, a presentation called Why Play Framework is So Fast. So uh, Dragos Manolescu, if you're listening, uh, you can check out the TypeSafe uh, uh, SlideShare account, and you'll find a, a presentation called Why Play is So Fast. But Jamie, do you want to speak to that real quick? Absolutely, because Dragos and I go way back. We worked together in New York in 2000, and we're good friends. Good to hear from you, Dragos. Um, so 
this has to be an apples to apples comparison. If somebody says that Netty is faster than Play, they're absolutely right. And the reason is that Play is actually running on top of Netty currently, and it's doing a lot more. It's a, a full featured web based application framework, right? Whereas Netty is just socket handling that's actually built on top of you know, the concepts inside of Java and I.O. So um, if you're comparing apples to apples, like it doesn't make sense for us to compare the performance of Spray, a lightweight RESTful API, you know, uh, uh, framework versus a full-featured web API like Play. Um, Play does very well against other full-stack web uh, web-based frameworks like Spring MVC, like uh, you know, uh, Ruby on Rails, obviously Grails. Uh, it, it does extremely well compared to those. So in the apples to apples world, um, yeah, you know, it, it's it's good. But yeah, and, and the worst part is you look at things like Tech and Power. Uh, the early the early things that they were doing were actually just benchmarks running on their MacBooks, which was not really representative of a production environment or anything like that. Or the fact that a you know a, a, a framework like Play configured properly could use as much of the resources on a huge box, whereas you know something like uh, a Ruby on Rails might not be able to. So. We're we're very comfortable with the performance that play gets. Nobody is telling us that play isn't uh, isn't giving them the performance that they want. So. Okay. Thanks, Dragos. Well, <laughs> uh, it seems like we're all out of time. It's the top of the hour. So uh, feel free, uh, folks, if you have some more questions that you would love to have answered, feel free to uh, ping us on Twitter at TypeSafe, or you can uh, send in some. Uh, questions to the uh, individual project teams. So scalalang.org, aka.io, and playframework.com are good places to go for any of these other questions. And uh, thank you very much, Jamie. It was a great, uh, great webinar. And we'll see you all next time. Thanks so much.